Hello and welcome to What Goes Up, a weekly markets podcast. My name is Mike Regan. I'm a senior editor at Bloomberg. And I'm Vildana Hayek, a cross-asset reporter with Bloomberg. And this week, Vildana, a very special episode so of special. What Goes Up. You know, when I was a kid in the 70s and 80s, the best TV was always the crossover events. Are you sure? You, was this the 1870s? Oh, I knew that was coming. Old shaming, as usual. But I had to Google it to figure out what the best crossover okay. TV episodes ever were. Do you know what the first one I think was? No. Superman on I Love Lucy in 1957. How about wow. that? Yeah, I was not around for that. But I was around for the Jetsons meet the Flintstones. That was a thing? You remember the, the Jetsons no. meet the... I don't know how the Jetsons could have met the Flintstone. It doesn't seem logical. Yeah, because one is future, one is past, right? Yeah. Yeah. So here's one of your generation, yeah. I think. Okay. The Sweet Life of Hannah Montana. Do you remember that? Oh, my God. I watched that when I was little. Did yeah. Right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Miley Cyrus. Miley Cyrus. You watched Hannah Montana? Of course. And did you remember them? her on The Sweet Life? No. Yeah. The Sweet Life with Zach and Cody. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Anyway. No, I don't remember that. The point is, I love a good crossover episode. Yeah. We have one today. We do. We're really, really fortunate to have Joe Weisenthal and Tracy Alloway, the co-hosts or hosts, hosts. Co-host. Co-host. Co-host works. Yeah. Of what goes up. No, I'm just kidding. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> the Jetsons. We have the Jetsons meeting we the Flintstones. the Jetsons meeting the Flintstones. They're, they are the hosts of the uber, super popular Odd Lots podcast. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So we're really happy psyched, to have you. Very guys. psyched to be here. But anyway, we want to actually start out by talking about you guys a cool. little bit. Cool. Cool. Love it. We're going to put you on the spot. Okay. Now. But actually, Joe, right before we started taping, you said you... Sp- when you were little, you lived in Malaysia. I did. I lived for, I, I moved around a fair amount when I was a kid. And my dad was a, um, he was a physics professor. And the Malaysian government in the, I don't know, maybe they still have the program. But in the late 80s and early 90s, they had this program where they imported American university professors to Malaysia for a few years so that local, like sort of like promising students could train under like a sort of U.S. style university system for their first two years of college and then complete their degrees in the U.S. for their final two years. So that was really fun. I want to go back to Malaysia. And here I thought you were from Texas. No, I'm a faux Texan. (laughs) I went to college there. That's a popular misconception. I always thought I was from Texas. I'm glad I give off. I'm glad I pull it off. (laughs) You've got the swagger, the (laughs) cowboy swagger. Well, because you go to Texas on vacation I went to college there and I go back there a lot. Yeah. 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 You do that. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, Tracy, Tr- Tracy what you? what's your backstory then? Can we- you give us the actual the chronology? Because I've like no, I can't because I don't remember everything. So I was born in Arkansas in a place that no longer exists. It was a military base. My dad was with the Air Force, and then I lived in Chicago for a bit, Dallas for a bit, and then I moved to. I was in Tokyo for part of preschool, and then at some point I moved to Tokyo first to fourth grade, and then I was in Chicago for middle school. And then I was in Vienna for two years. And then my last two years of high school were in Tokyo. It's interesting. You both have sort of this, you know, grew up moving around a lot. Vildana and I, I think we, I've barely left the tri-state area. But let's get into sort of, I want to talk about what makes you two such good co-hosts and what, what makes you tick. Because I feel like there's a bit of a yin and yang thing going on. You know, I, I look at Tracy and I, the way you view markets, and correct me if I'm if I'm making too many leaps here, but you're almost like a chief risk officer to me. You you look at the mm. economy and markets from that angle, whereas Joe is sort of like, I don't know, and this is a compliment, but sort of perennial <laughs> optimist, <laughs> risk embracing. I mean, is that yeah. a fair way to, to describe think, you two? I think we skew in those respective directions. I think I've spoken about this before, but a lot of my career as a financial journalist was colored by the 2008 financial crisis. I actually left Bloomberg and (gasps) joined the (gasps) FT in September of 2008. And that was the first time I covered hardcore finance, so banks and markets. And you can imagine what that experience was like. And I think to some degree that has shaped my approach to financial journalism, which is you're always looking for the next risk over the horizon. That's kind of where the big prize is for a lot of financial journalists. But I have also come to realize, thanks in part to Joe, that there is a whole other discourse of financial journalism out there. You know, people are interested in potential investments. Obviously, people are interested in how things actually work. And that has been very, very fun to cover. I love 
the framework. Our old colleague Luke Kawa has said multiple times that Tracy is value and I'm momentum, <laughs> which is basically <laughs> like, like you know, Tracy captures the value factor. It's like eternal, and you know, like me, I. And, you know, it's like, oh, everyone's talking about crypto now. And it's not that, like, I'm into crypto per se or, like, that I'm into AI or whatever. It's more just that, like, oh, this is the thing and I want to figure it out. And then Tracy is, like, the ballast. Maybe, like, you know, Tracy is the bonds and the 60-40 portfolio <laughs> of, and I'm the stocks or something like that. I do think that it balances out well. We're, that completes the uh, optimal portfolio allocation between the <laughs> two of us. Well, no, that's an interesting way to think of it because I think – you know, risk aversion is probably the biggest mistake. Over too much risk aversion is the biggest mistake an investor can make, I think. Totally. And this is something that, <laughs> so I used to write a lot about credit and corporate bonds. And I, I kept writing about how, oh, when interest rates go up, this is going to be a big, big issue. And I kind of had to get over that to some extent <laughs> because in 2020, you know, what did we see? We saw the Fed announce a corporate bond buying program. And after that, I think the risk kind of shifts a little bit. And you start to realize that there are a lot of problems out there in the world, but central banks are also sort of endlessly creative at solving mm. them. And to some extent, I stopped worrying so much about those types of risks. No. I do think it's interesting. I mean, now we're actually talking literally about like sort of financial assets, but it is interesting. I've always think, you know, if you're like into bonds, the y your payout is capped, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know that you want to like get paid back at $100 on the dollar. It's the downside that can, you know, go all the way to zero. So it's like an entirely a sort of worldview of like downside avoidance, whereas with stocks, you know, the upside is theoretically unlimited. So it's like you have one side that's trying to like cut off the left tail and you have another side that's trying to like shoot for the right tail. But I really do think like in covering markets too, you start to see these like personality types like emerge where it's like, I don't know, stock people seem a little sunnier. Commodity yeah. <laughs> people are the most sociopathic because they're sort of betting <laughs> against human ingenuity. And bond people are like the most like sort of like, yeah, like risk avoidant because they already know what their op the best outcome is. They're just trying to cut off the worst outcomes. Yeah. And then there are FX traders. <laughs> what about crypto? Yeah. Crypto, I don't it's like this like weird mix of like optimism and like deranged pessimism. I don't know. Like No, you're absolutely right. Yeah. It, it's like we're gonna get a massive payout because the world the is going down. to be it's terrible. Very strange, yeah. 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 All right. Well, Tracy, I'm gonna appoint you chief risk officer of <laughs> odd lots. I like that. Oh, yeah. thank you. But Joe has always been a big proponent of the trillion dollar coin. For those who are unfamiliar, I don't know how you could be after all the talk of it, of it but <laughs> the idea is that when the government, when Congress reaches this impasse on raising the debt ceiling, mm -hmm. that there's an obscure law that allows the Treasury to mint a trillion dollar coin. It's such a Joe topic, and I love that about it. It's like, because it's quirky, it's weird, but also it is like a potential real life solution to a mm -hmm. major problem. That is worth discussing. And this past episode of the debt ceiling talks, I feel like it it bubbled up to the t as high as it, it can get. It bubbles up every time. Yeah. It never actually happens. <laughs> so, uh, One day. Well, let's hear let's hear your take on the trillion dollar coin. So, first of all, let me say I admire Joe's commitment Thank to you. the trillion Thank dollar you. coin. <laughs> That's all I ask. And in many ways, it is a exceedingly clever loophole. That sort of gets to the heart of the way the U.S. monetary and legal system actually works. However, my issue with it, I think, is optics matter, right? And I think pitching this idea as like we got a lot of really smart people in a room to find a really esoteric loophole that, you know, is difficult to explain to a lot of people and then trying to explain that to a general population of voters, I think, would be extremely difficult. So that's number one. You yeah. can imagine the Fox News headlines on Democrats <laughs> minting the coin effectively. And then the second thing that worries me about it is it is a very clever loophole, but a loophole nonetheless. And we might think it's worthwhile in the context of a debt ceiling argument. But what about the next president? Yeah. What if the next president decides, oh, actually, I can do something similar to, I don't know, fund my like fascist army or something like that. Yeah. That worries me. Yeah. And loopholes seem great when they're being used for things that you agree with. They do not seem so great when they're being used for things that are 
more nefarious. All right, I'll give you my one worry about it, then we'll okay. let Joe respond to all of it. Mm-hmm. My worry is, like, it could create a Liz Truss type of moment in the markets. You know, the UK leader who introduced, you know, big tax cuts. Uh, and, Joe and, has thoughts on Liz Truss, too, <laughs> yeah. by the so way. And the lettuce, yeah. right? This was the but lettuce. It, but my fear would be that would be this immediate reaction in the markets, like, that would cause, you know, whatever, the dollar to sink, mm-hmm. bond yields to go nuts. Everything you guys say is probably mostly right. I'll say two things. It's like one is the worst outcome I think of a debt ceiling fiasco would be an actual missed credit payment or missed treasury yeah. payment. Mm-hmm. And That's there fair. are many things, loopholes, gimmicks, potential market risk, credibility things that would probably be worth taking if the alternative is an actual default on the debt. And the other thing is I'll just say like as my enthusiasm, it's like in addition to being a loophole like – and Tracy sort of hinted at this – I love the didactic potential of it because you do learn a lot through like how our monetary system is like and these conversations, why wouldn't it cause inflation? And you learn a lot about constitutional origins, et cetera. So it's almost like a thought experiment in the form of a physical coin. It's like it's something it's it is this like physical thing that could exist. But there are so many interesting legal and economic ideas embedded in this coin that I can't help but resist want to see it happen one day. Is there a little bit of mischievousness, too, on, on your Well, end? you know what? I'd just say yes. But what I really do enjoy about it from a sort of like mischief standpoint is that most arguments against it, not saying Tracy's or yours, but most arguments end up being extremely bad and easily debunked and easily argued against. And so what I sort of enjoy from a, you could call it trolling, or but it's a, is that you do see these people like tilt at windmills because it seems like, oh, it's obviously dumb. And then like one by one, the sort of like act, their arguments fall apart, which is weird. And so it's kind of, you can have a lot of fun with it. Anyway. This is great for me and you, Mike, because we're creating a lot of controversy <laughs> yeah. with, this, with this podcast. Okay, the other thing about both of you, and I've worked with both of you in different capacities over the last couple of years. But also, you guys have so many ideas about stories that should be written about the Mm. market. Mm. Like, really good ideas all the time. Like, Tracy, I remember one of your mayonnaise story was so good. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was so good. I was toying with whether or not to do a third edition of mayonnaise this year. Maybe I will. Just do it. August is mayonnaise season for me, so (laughs) maybe I will. Another topic you guys have been talking about a lot is organized labor Mm -hmm. and and you've had some episodes about this and i think tracy you called it the hot union summer (laughs) i think joe pointed out i was probably not the first person to say that but it does feel like there is something in the air with more proactive labor union movements and we talked about this actually in one of our really early pandemic episodes we had on a financial historian to talk about what happened to the labor market after the plague in the middle ages and he made the point that because so many people died there was a lot of power that sort of swung to labor. And so you did see start to see some pushback against, I guess, the sort of land barons of that time. Yeah. And maybe, you know, maybe that's what we're seeing now. The labor conversation, I feel like, touches on so many different dynamics that we like to. Like, what happens when labor markets just get really tight and mm. worker bargaining power, which is something we discussed for years before the pandemic. And why was wage growth so mediocre and stuff, et cetera? The role of like organized labor is like there's all this domestic investment in electric vehicles and electrifying, you know, decarbonization. That's really interesting tension. Corporate profits Corporate as well, profit. which is something we've been talking a lot about. Yeah. So I just feel. Yeah. And and also, you know, like so much of the 70s inflation story is like caught up in this thing of like this, the sort of wage price spiral and the unions being able to claim higher wages and then the work, the company's trying to pass that on. And so like the, the labor dimension is just seems like like this big through line across so many of our different themes. Yeah. There's a headline out this week, the UPS, the new contract at oh, yeah. the end of it. Drivers will be making like one seven hundred and seventy thousand dollars with a year. benefits. Which hey, it's a hard job, and uh, yeah, you know they they deserve it. But but you know, it is it is part of so many other stories too, like the Yellow Core mm-hmm. bankruptcy. That partly was also triggered by yeah. I think union talks, right? That company was like in deep distress for years, but that was yeah. that did seem to be the straw that finally broke. They the definitely back. blamed it on the union. They definitely for blamed sure. it on the union. Yeah. All right, another hot button topic. Are you ready? What is it? Take a deep breath. <gasps> MMT. I want to talk a little bit about <laughs> MMT. The Wait, coin. but can I just say, Tracy is like, even though she would claim to like or disclaim MMT, the MMTers 
all love many of Tracy's formulations. Like, oh, Tracy really nailed it. Well, I, I, my okay. <laughs> Here, here's my on the record stance on MMT. First, can you ex- you'll explain it better than I can? Oh, let Joe explain a, 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 a it. A this brief. Is- I would describe MMT as the simple characterization that a government in that a government's constraint is not the same as a household constraint where it's like, oh, you're not going to have enough income to pay your debts. That a government's constraint is the flip, which is that the constraint on spending is real resources in the economy. And if you spend too much, then you get inflation and that that imposes some sort of limit on what you can spend. But they're trying to gauge a government spending capacity by just looking at things like deficits. The gap between revenue and income won't get you very far. And I actually... I, I agree with all of that. However, my, my I guess... It's like a therapy session for you two here. I feel like. <laughs> this is very Thank cathartic. You. We charge a lot for hours. Joe though. and I yelling at each other. <laughs> no, I agree with that. My problem with it is I don't find it that useful because mm. in practice, it already seems to exist. I mean, we've watched the U.S. deficit go up and up and up. It wasn't really a problem until we had inflation and MMT has a lot to say about that. And I, I agree, but in practice, viewing it through that framework, I don't think leads to different actions. And then the other thing I would say is I question its usefulness even more for emerging markets. And we've talked about this Mm -hmm. on our podcast. Well, the one thing I'm wondering in this current environment, MMT would sort of suggest that the way to beat inflation is raise taxes, right? Mm -hmm. Or cut spending, I guess, but probably raise taxes. And I feel like that's its Achilles heel in that when could you ever get a politician? This is exactly it. So it's like, okay, we're going to shift the conversation among politicians from like, oh, we have to worry about the deficit. So we can't spend this or we can't yeah. enact tax cuts or whatever. And you're supposed to shift the conversation to inflation. But talking about inflation and why it's happening and the sources of inflation is even more difficult in some respects than talking about things from a pure budget perspective. And I think we've really seen that over the past couple of years. So again, I question the utility. So if you put an automatic trigger in a mm. law saying inflation's above 3%, taxes go up. It's bad enough when politicians argue over, oh, this is going to cost, you know, $1 billion. It will be even worse when they start talking about, oh, this is going to cause a, you know, 0.2% increase mm. in inflation. I do think also, I mean, to the point, you know, you see the fight over even the pause over student debt payments mm. and how fraught that is. So I think like a pr- it is a pretty good critique of MMT as a sort of like working political theory. The idea that like that if there are theoretically times in which it makes sense to have fiscal constraints. Yeah. And that yeah. is difficult. And that's arguably like one of the reasons that the Fed exists because Paul, you know, that or why this sort of the current notion of what Fed independence actually is was sort of built on this idea that, like, well, politicians can't be assumed to do what's right. And I'll say the one thing, you know, the one other thing is, like, Tracy came up with the formulation that, like, any problem that you can solve with money isn't really a problem, <laughs> which all the MMTers love. So even though Tracy, <laughs> like, they've always like, oh, we love Tracy's line about any problem you can solve with money isn't, like, really a problem. So the one other thing I would say, just, you know, out of mutual respect for the MMTers is, I am a huge fan of any iconoclastic Mm. economist who is actually thinking up new ideas for the way the world works. So massive respect for Stephanie Kelton. I think she's done some phenomenal work. I do have questions about it, but kudos to her for looking at things in a slightly different way. And as a description of the current situation, MMT's it's right. I yeah. mean, you know, so there's I mean, that. No, let's just leave it there. <laughs> that's good. That's good. That's good. All right. What's the next topic? I will say for a lot of these topics, the first time I learn of them or or like really start looking into them or become interested in them is because you guys are talking about it Too on, kind. on Twitter. Too kind. On, yeah. on X. On, on X. X. Yeah. <laughs> okay. X. Another one. And you guys also did an, a recent episode about this. It's a company most Americans don't know anything about. BYD, the Chinese EV maker. Yeah. Yes, and so EVs in general, because Tracy, I'm going to quote you again. Mm. You said there's an there's this ongoing tension between wanting to create a vibrant and competitive EV industry and battery making in the U.S., which BYD is in China, 
but also attaching better work conditions mm. for workers. So this all so- sort of ties some of these themes together. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think we've spoken to some senior officials from the Biden administration about this tension. There is a desire to create specific industry within the U.S., like batteries, like EVs, solar panels, maybe, at scale and in an efficient way. But at the same time, you want to create good working conditions. You want to make sure that this is a valuable industry for the U.S. And I think there's there's a real tension there between creating an efficient, presumably affordable product that Americans can buy and competing with other places in the world. It, I mean, I, I do think this is just this huge story, the how cheap the and, you know, the improving quality of Chinese electric vehicles and their competitive price points, it seems to be creating all kinds of stress in Europe right now, or mm-hmm. the beginning more so than the U.S. But I do think it'll be it's interest. I do think like there are some very exciting things happening domestically in the U.S. with like our battery investments and the Inflation Reduction Act, et cetera. And like every other day, there's some new announcement of a new plant, and it's just like unreal the growth that we're seeing in spending on manufacturing facilities. And I'm not convinced necessarily that, like, the level of U.S. wages is going to be a problem. But I do I do think it's highly TBD whether all of these facilities end up producing competitive products Mm. on a global scale. Joe, this reminds me of a tweet I think you had this week sometime. And I know you guys have had a few guests on talking about the notion of Bidenomics. Yeah. But to me, what's fascinating is this perception of the economy. Mm -hmm. And you tweeted out one of the consumer uh, confidence surveys where, or maybe it was the National Federation of Small Uh, Businesses, but one of those surveys where it's like, Democrats think the economy is great. You know, empirically, you look at the numbers, it's all great. But Republicans think we're just going to hell. Like, what what do you you, you explain that? that, that I mean, it does seem like so many people in the U.S. right now are almost in K. And it, I, you know, the, the, the data th- suggests, I think it is a little bit more extreme for Republicans, but I actually think, quote, on you know, both sides, there is extreme level of inability to sort of view the economy outside of the partisan lens. Yeah. Mm. And if the president is not your party, it is pretty dramatic how much that will sway your view on what is going on. And it's sort of like, do you think I'll tell you what. Is feel, it partly media consumption? Do you think if you're, I'm if you're sure watching media a lot of right wing consum- media, I'm sure the sort of it, uh, that would not surprise me at all. You know, what? I feel sorry for people like that. I actually like do. I like the inability of we all know them too in real life, right? The inability of people to like think clearly and critically outside of the lens of is this a Democrat thing or Republican thing? Like, of course, it's sort of annoying, but I actually like feel sorry for people whose minds are caught in that trap. I think partisanship is a huge aspect of this. And there's a lot of noise in the surveys right now. And and some of it is due to media consumption. And we're not the only ones who have said this. Paul Donovan over at UBS has Mm -hmm. talked about this. The other thing I would say is I I do think there is a real segmentation in the economy now between people who earn less and people who earn more. And for people who earn more, you know— Higher inflation is probably something that they can deal with. For Mm -hmm. people who earn less, it might actually be that they're not seeing the benefits of a lot of the things that we're talking about, the things that are showing up in the hard numbers. I think both those things can be simultaneously true. You very humbly name dropped talking to White House officials. (laughs) 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 But you guys did talk to Jared Bernstein recently. and. I think the topic was Bidenomics, right? And it does seem like the White House is trying to... mm. Wait, let me name drop someone. Okay, go ahead. Uh, You know, Joe Biden guest lectured my college economics class. Oh, really? I thought you were about to say, Vildana, I booked Joe Biden for us for next week. (laughs) Because that would have been better. I can't remember. If I would have known he was going to be president, I would have taken better (laughs) notes. notes. You have the inside scoop on Bidenomics. I I think we were all like, are we going to be tested on this? And they said no, and we all just kind of tuned out. Did you Did you miss that class? (laughs) <laughs> no, I was, there. I was there. But anyway, well, maybe talk yeah. about some of the highlights from the Jared Bernstein conversation. What's really interesting to me is that they've chosen this moment to say, like, actually, we're happy with the economy. We're proud of this hmm. economy. And I think that's really telling because, like, the economy in you know summer 2023, inflation has come down a bit. But, like, 
you know, it's not it's still high, right? Or it still seems to be high. Core inflation, I guess, is cooling a fair amount. It, it's still high, and I think they're in consumer sentiment numbers are not great. They've some of them have bounced back a little bit. But what's in and the unemployment rate's very low. But it's not that different than the economy several months ago. So it is sort of notable to me that at some point this summer the Biden administration was like, you know what, we're gonna pivot and rather than sort of like sort of distract from the economy, we're actually going to like claim ownership of this economy, which I think in itself is pretty interesting. And I think like, you know, I do think that there is like a a feeling among the staffers to the Biden administration that they've done a better job of coming out of disaster than the Obama administration did. Because like both Biden and Obama came out of like kind of like economic disasters of one sort or another. And I think that there is like a feeling is like, yeah, this was the better way. We Maybe there was an overshoot of spending or stimulus or something, but we're, there's a lot being done. There's a lot of domestic investment. And it's actually like has some teeth. I agree with that. The one other thing I would say is it's going to be really interesting to see whether this sort of more interventionist style of economic policy sticks around and for how long. Because I I remember, I think in 2020, I wrote an article called The Choke Point Economy, Mm. basically about how the pandemic had revealed all these choke points within the global economy. You know, we discovered that we couldn't get enough semiconductors or goods being shipped from China took a lot longer and infrastructure at the ports was lacking, things like that. And the governments were becoming more attuned to these issues and more willing to invest in them. And I think that's certainly a thesis that's been borne out by the past couple of years. However, with the ensuing inflation, Mm. with the fact that despite a lot of the hard numbers showing the economy is still going well, but some of the messaging not necessarily sticking with voters, is that attitude going to be around the next time, you know, five or 10 years, let's say. And I think to Joe's point, There is a lot of agreement that the more active fiscal intervention in 2020 was massively helpful, but I'm kind of interested in seeing whether or not that conclusion sticks in, say, a decade. Are people going to remember it for that or are they going to learn the wrong lessons that inflation was really high and it was still a struggle to convince people that we had successfully managed one of the worst global pandemics in 100 years? Yeah. I think, uh, well, in addition to having a podcast, you two have a very well edited, I would say, <laughs> newsletter. Yeah, Mike, lots is news our, <laughs> Mike is our, uh, he does an excellent job. I think it's job just editing. okay pe- edited. Pe- pe- people are saying it's very, very well edited. Who are, are these people? You're the one reader we can always count on. <laughs> many, <laughs> many people are saying it's the best edited <laughs> newsletter in Bloomberg. I've heard that, yeah. <laughs> Tears in their eyes. Uh, but you've gotten into some very interesting topics, and I, I recommend everyone to subscribe if they haven't already. But it's a great way to sort of get your undistilled thoughts on, mm. on these things. Tracy, you had one recently, A Brave New World Built on Bonds, basically talking about, well, here we go. We had another credit rating cut mm-hmm. on the U.S. sovereign rating. Does it matter? Does, has the bond market moved away from credit ratings? This week, we saw Moody's come out and just sort of dump all over slam all the banks, the banks slam, yeah. slam all, all the banks. And you had another one talking about the extend and pretend idea, mm. you know, a, a throwback to the financial crisis where there's a lot of commercial real estate loan workouts being done right now. Mm-hmm. Try to sort of do whatever you can to adjust the terms to avoid companies going bankrupt. I feel like people here extend and pretend and think of it as in a they derogatory. Yeah. yeah. Is it? I mean, it's only bad if it fails. <laughs> but but seriously, I think this is one of the things, you know, when we talk about at the beginning of this conversation, the big risks from 2008, there was a lot of extend and pretend post 2008. The economy recovered, albeit slowly and gradually. A lot of those workouts did, in fact, you know, reach their intended goal. We saw mark to market accounting suspended on bank balance sheets and a lot of those assets ended up recovering. And so I think we've actually written about this together, that the big plank of financial stability is, in fact, economic growth. And so if Mm. you see people extend and pretend for the foreseeable future, but the economy remains strong, maybe some of those office buildings get transformed into something else, maybe more people are called back into work, then it's a strategy that could be perfectly tenable. Yeah. Yeah. I've come at some point I came the realization, like, I don't know, the early 2010s, 
it's just all it's can kicking for forever. Mm. You just keep kicking that can, <laughs> and it, people say it as a pejorative. It's like no, we're gonna be can kicking till it worked I'm in dead, Europe, I guess. And then yeah. my kids are gonna be kicking the can because it's like oh, it's kicking the can. No, you just keep kicking it, <laughs> just, and then the kid, our kids and grandchildren, they'll just be keep, keep kicking that can. And I sort of think that like that sort of you know taking our lumps now has this like good feeling we're gonna like you know solve our problems or we're gonna like take the pain. And I just sort of think like, no, you just keep finding a way to muddle through. And that, that actually is how sort of the economy and humanity just sort of keeps keeps going through. Okay, Joe, I have an, a new question. Okay, sure. This is super interesting to me. And I think actually... Matt Levine ended up writing about this this mm. idea of yours as well. Cool. You said betting on downturns has been really costly for companies. So, oh, yeah, for yeah. instance, mm. Mm. right now, maybe we're not seeing as many companies letting yeah. people go because, you know, they think yeah. a downturn is coming. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, you know, the 2020s in many ways feel like the very reverse of the 2010s. So, in the 2010s, it's like double dip recessions when they're coming and didn't come. In. But like companies were so scared to invest and they're so scared to hire. But for the first time ever in like 2021 and 2022, or maybe not the first time ever, but for the first time in decades, really, I think companies suddenly are like, oh, we do not have an unlimited supply of workers, which is I don't think that many managers of corporations ever contemplated that idea, even in boom times, late 90s, whatever, that like, what if we just can't open our store because we can't hire? And I think that really had like a deep, like scarring effect on a lot of managers and management teams at companies. And I think that's a good, potentially portends good news like down the road, which is that, okay, that like they don't want to ever be back there again. And so they'll be slower to fire going forward, even if they see some signs of softness. And what's interesting is I, I always love one of my favorite things every month is when the Dallas Fed manufacturing report comes out. Uh, once a month, I always jump to the anecdotal section because like Texas, like business managers, you know, they're super swaggery and cocky and all that stuff. And so they always have very colorful things. But there's in recent months, some of them have been talking about how I'm looking forward to the next recession because I'm going to expand my investment and take market share from my opponents. But what's interesting about that is if everyone goes into so, the recession with that attitude, you're not going to get a recession because recession, you know. It's like so waiting if, to buy the dip. You, you know. So this is like the psychology you want to engender, I think, for the long boom, which is that if everyone, yeah, it's right. If everyone wants is excited to buy the dip, and we saw this in the 2010s, you don't get the dip. If everyone is excited about the downturn because they're going to, steal employees from the other company or steal market share, you can sustain an expansion for a long time. I agree with this. And I would also just add that we've seen some Fed officials start to talk about that recently, including Tom Barkin at the Richmond Fed recently. The one thing I would say with my sort of like risk officer Uh hat on (laughs) is a really, really bad thing for the economy would be something that causes everyone to wake up and go, oh, actually, I have massively overinflated Mm. my labor force for like business activity. Activity, a sort of Minsky moment yeah. in employment would be very, very bad. But I don't see anything. Yeah. Their that, mar- margins go down uh, and they. You yeah, know. something along those lines. But I think I think you shouldn't underestimate the sort of psychological yeah. effects here. And I do think it's true that people have been more scarred by not being able to ramp up capacity than by having too much capacity in the previous crisis. Yeah. But so, Joe, while, you know, Tracy and I are looking at the economy and markets, wondering what could go wrong, as I said, I I like how you're always looking for the next big thing, the next (laughs) big opportunity. You were the first one, I think, that I heard the words room temperature (laughs) superconductor. (laughs) Apparently it's not happening. Explain it and explain why it's important and and what we need to know about it. You know, it's... (laughs) <laughs> First of all, as of an hour ago, some university put out there's like this is there's no room temperature sub- <laughs> super It's actually just floating rocks. It's, it's just a floating rock. It's so hot and my cold. Da- I... My dad, by the way, is a physicist, and I saw him this past weekend. And I was like, "Will you come on? People would love it. It'd be so cool." Have it. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, "No, I'm not." But he did explain that, like you know, superconductivity. Obviously, this idea that you could like transmit energy across two things or across distances with no loss would be really powerful. And it exists currently. The problem is you need such high pressure or such cold temperatures to do it that there are very few actual like 
applications of it. Like apparently MRI technology is one. But he said that like were the holy grail to be found of where you didn't, that it would create all kinds of like new consumer gadgets and certain like energy things. And I get, you know, I'm literally just repeating what my, my dad yeah. said. He had all these <laughs> stuff about like bosons and things like that that he was getting into, which I didn't. It would have been a great episode. I'm really annoyed that he, he said yes to us, actually. Oh, he's going <laughs> to yeah. he's, he's gonna be on what goes up. Let's give a fuck him build out of What goes up. But you know, actually, the, the, the thing that was sort of interesting to me about it is like the idea of energy loss over some distance is very intuitive because there's no free lunches in the world, right? Like if you get something, it's like, you're okay, it's like, you're going to transmit energy, but you're going to have some loss, or you can have no energy loss, but then it has to be at negative 500 Celsius. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You always have to like, pay the price somehow. So yeah. I asked him, like, why do P- scientists even think room temperature superconductivity is theoretically possible if we know that there's no like sort of like free lunch in the universe? And what he suspected was that were there ever to be a substance that were that was found that had this property of room temperature superconductivity, his guess is that it would be very costly to synthesize, to make. And so you would pay the price not in the application layer, but in the creation of the material layer. So you'd still like have this, you, you, there'd be no free lunch. Nonetheless, he does think were it to be found, which he's not totally dismissive of the possibility that one day it would be, that it would open up new things, but it would still be like, difficult to synthesize in large batches. Interesting, because this was one of the things about the LK99 yeah. formulation, which was like, actually, it wasn't that difficult yeah. to do. So people were simultaneously excited right. about the potential for a room temperature superconductor, but also that it wasn't that difficult to make. I guess yeah. I guess it turns out yeah. <laughs> it's easy to make. It's just, <laughs> it's just very magnetic. <laughs> I was sure that tungsten cubes would be involved somehow. One day. Some one day, my, one day my, the tungsten cube that I have in the bin. But, well, I remember you brought it in and then and everybody was like, Everyone if you want to go see it, you got to go to Joe's desk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Community, community cube. Uh, anyway, it's that time, Vildana. It is. For the craziest things mm. we saw in markets this week. I hope you two came prepared. This is, this is the be big prepared. reveal. Oh, sure. Oh, wait, you, wait, I'm going to go first, just okay. on the off chance that, that we chose the same one. But mine is connected to the superconductor stuff, which is last week when there was all this excitement over the potential LK99 breakthrough in South Korea, we saw shares of a company called American Superconductor shoot to the proverbial moon, (laughs) a company that, as far as I could tell, had absolutely nothing to do with the South Korean researchers. It just had a superconductor in its name. And fast forward to this week, and it is down a lot. (laughs) The thing that still weirds me out or this thing that I still don't get is like why U.S. investors got really weirded out, freaked out by like the Bank of Japan ending yield curve control. It's mm. like, come on, who cares? Yeah. And like, <laughs> suddenly like, oh, I'm going to like sell my like portfolio of U.S. equities because like the Bank of Japan did like their millionth tweak to like yeah. the shape of the yield curve. Like, I'm sorry. I, I mean, maybe I'm missing something. And like if like the stock market crashes from here then this will be embarrassing. It's just hard for me to get excited about that one. So the fact that some people managed to get excited about that, I can consider to be impressive. The only thought I had is maybe the carry trade, but I don't think you buy equities with the carry trade, really. Maybe you do. I don't know. know. If if you want to sell your stock to me because of the carry trade or something, (laughs) I'll I'll pick them up. Wasn't the argument that it was going to take a a big chunk of bond buyers, like move them away, and that bonds are the underpinning for equities and a lot of other things? Maybe. It, it did seem like an overreaction, though. I, I, I agree. It's going to be really embarrassing in a week when, when the market's down. I can't, I can't wait to point it out. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to say, listen to this episode where Joe embarrasses himself. Okay, mine is about Zoom. Oh, um, yeah, the yeah, company we all use to Zoom, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I think I know what this one is. And if it is this, it's a good one. It is yeah. good because they're asking their employees to come yeah. work from the office. I, yeah, I don't. Do, do you think they still zoom each other in the office though? Like, like right so, they go, right? so they yeah. go to the office and then also zoom each other. That wouldn't be unheard of. <laughs> it's not unheard it says, of. We have all done it. Yeah. But it's just times. it's funny because they're Zoom, but they're asking you people to think, be in person. You would think they'd be like everyone stay at home. You know, you never Forever. know. Another pandemic did, could be coming. Did you guys too. read the last Zoom conference call about? It, you should read it. It's from, from about a month and a half ago. And it was like the ultimate, like, 
flavor of the month. Every question was about their AI strategy. <laughs> yeah, Every yeah, question yeah, is, yeah, what yeah. are you doing in general? Yeah. I don't know. It's like they make a video thing, right? <laughs> no, no, they had a good answer. They did have good answers. But talk about like the degree to which like analysts all like sort of school of fish yep, kind yep. of swimming. It was, it's a very funny read. Next call, it'll be what? Superconductors. Yeah, like, right. What are you doing <laughs> with, with energy transfer? Right, right, but there exactly. is there's a meme on the former Twitter on X where it's just a picture of like a Zoom office of like a Zoom skyscraper and then somebody being like, they have offices? Like, <laughs> why would they have offices? <laughs> They're Zoom. All right. I got I got mine. Mine is a game show, actually. Ooh. I'm so excited to actually have three contestants on it. It makes me feel like a real game show host oh. when there's three because it's sort of a price is right. We call okay. it the price is precise. Oh, now, we can't fun. call it price is right. Yeah, yeah for, price for is legal like reasons. Price, price is precise. 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 So, all right, this is uh, courtesy of the Wall Street Journal. I'm, I'm saddened we did not have this story. Silicon Valley Bank went out of business. We all know that. Went into FDIC receivership. So what happens in that process is the FDIC sells off all the assets of the bank. One of the more interesting assets they're selling off is SVB had a huge wine collection. Why? They had 1,900 bottles of wine, 1,900 bottles. Well, I was wondering the same thing, and there's an old Wall Street Journal story that explains it. Being in Silicon Valley, they do a lot of business with the wine growers oh. yeah. in Northern California. This guy, there's some guy who actually pitched them on starting a wine business, wine lend, you know, lending money collateralized to collateralized. That's wine what I'm yeah, collateral, I, I, yeah. I, I'm dying to know if any of these were actual collateral on some of these loans, but it's, it was something like 4% of their loan book was to winemakers mm. in Northern California. So let me give you a little bit more details here before we play the prices precise. 1,900 bottles of fine wine, 400 bottles in the Santa Clara branch, 300 in the Menlo Park branch, where they were, quote, meticulously racked and kept in climate-controlled environment. The rest were in a private wine vault in Domain, Napa. Now, I'll give you one hint. They were auctioned off at a 60% discount to the appraised value. So, time to play Price is Precise. How many bottles in total? 1,900 bottles. Okay. At a 60% discount. At a 40% discount. 60%. Okay. No, oh, you're right. 40% discount. They, yeah, okay. they sold at 60% of the appraised value. So, it's California wine, so it's tricky. You know, it's not known for <laughs> super expensive wine. And they've had lots of wildfires. That's true. Well, I didn't think it's that. It's 1,900. I mean, I drink oh, Joe's light beer, so this is out. a Let's tough go. one for me. Well, well that you got to oh start. Oh my gosh! Usually, I have like some idea. Okay, two hundred thousand, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. That was a quick answer. Was, really? I like how quick is, that, is that was. All right, I'm going to write these down. Okay. Voldana bids two hundred fifty thousand. Now, the rules of that other game show are in place, so you could bid one dollar. Oh, I think I'm going to go higher. I'm going to say one point six million. What? One point six million. We, now we know bottles? what kind of wine Tracy drinks. How many <laughs> bottles are we talking about? 1,900 1, bottles oh, 1900. of California wine. Remember, I'm going to assume... Remember the rules now. Don't give him <laughs> hints. I'm going to go lower. I'm going to go 120,000. My God. That's pretty close. 130,000. Oh, come on. This is bad wine. Joe wins the, <laughs> the prices. For, well, you figure... Yeah. I mean, $100 a bottle yeah. would get you to 190,000. Yeah. So That's it, basically... Uh, this is bad collateral. <laughs> Speaking of Say collateral, that. and I, maybe I should bad have said liquidity. this. So we recently did an episode of the podcast with the CFO of CoreWeave, which is building a GPU cloud. A week later, there's a really good story. They borrowed two and a half billion, and they put up NVIDIA chips as I collateral. I saw that, yeah. So that came out after the episode, but uh, chips is the new collateral. So you can just pull those chips out of the server, I guess? Apparently, yeah. yeah and they I, still work. Yeah. That's crazy. Well, Joe and Tracy, what a great Thank time. you so much. We, we had a blast. blast. Thank you. Did you? I, we, <laughs> it was very fun. <laughs> she never believes anything. I know. I, I, that's just a lot of fun. What Goes Up will be back next week. Until then, you can find us on the Bloomberg Terminal website and app or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love it if you took the time to rate and review the show so more listeners can find us. You can find us on Twitter. Follow me, at Vildana Hyrick. Mike Regan is at Reganonymous. You can also follow Bloomberg Podcasts at Podcasts. What Goes Up is produced by Stacey Wong, and our head of podcasts is Sage Bauman. 
Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.